everybody make their way to their seats and uh, everybody stand up for me, please. We'll go ahead and get started. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord, no tender voice like
my righteousness. Oh God, how I need you. Church. My name's Dave. I'm on staff here, and we are so excited you're here. You picked a great day to be here today. We're going to talk all about our kids and our children's ministry and why we do what we do, and we hope you'll be blessed by your time with us. Uh, two quick announcements. One, if you didn't grab one of these, make sure you do because there's a ton of great information in them, like our men's softball league that's starting up, and we want you to be a part of that. And there's a sign up on the welcome desk. I think Nate Green's going to have a quick meeting of information afterwards. That's just one of the things in here. Second thing is, if you are a first-time guest or the first time in a while guest, there is a card in the back of the chair. If you'll fill that out, take that to the information desk on your way out this morning, we've got a free present for you. No strings attached. We just want to say, hey, give you something to take home and enjoy and have some fun with. But above all, we just want you to hear that we're glad you're here today. So keep standing, keep worshiping, and we'll get back into it this morning. All right, here we go. Hear the holy roar of God resound. Hear the holy roar of God resound. Watch the waters part before us now. has done for us and still the world of his great love our God is a God who saves our God is a God who saves let God arise let God arise our God reigns now and forever he reigns now and forever Arise, arise, our God reigns. 
enemies will run for sure. And the church will stand, she will endure. He holds the life of life, our Lord. Death has no sting, no final. church. It's my privilege this morning to prepare our hearts and our minds for the Lord's Supper today. And I want to start with a reading from Psalm chapter 1. I've been doing a lot of reading in the Psalms lately, and I think there is uh, some awesome things that we can take from that this, this morning. So Psalm chapter 1 reads, Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, 
or stand around with sinners or join in with the mockers, but they delight in the Lord in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. They are like trees planted along the river bank, bearing fruit each season. Their leaves will never wither and they prosper in all that they do. But not the wicked, they are like worthless chaff that is scattered away by the wind. They will be condemned at the time of judgment. Sinners will have no place among the godly, for the Lord watches over the path of the godly, but the path of the wicked will lead to destruction. That, pa that passage reminds me of a very common phrase. And that phrase is, if you stand for nothing, you will fall for everything, anything, everything. And here today, as we gather as a family, preparing for the Lord's Supper, we have a Savior who we are called to be mindful of, to remember. That's why we're here right now, is to remember. And so as we think about that, we have a Savior that we need to remind ourselves stands for us, always. He has promised that he will intercede on our behalf in the throne room of God. And today, we get to stand with him. We get to stand with each other as a family and honor that commitment that Jesus has made to us. We get to reflect that commitment back to him. And just like that passage in Psalm says, we are to stand with him like a tree that is rooted on the riverbank. And because of him, we will bear good fruit. Let us remind ourselves why we stand this morning, why it is that we are rooted in Jesus. To close, I wanna use a quote from Crazy Love, one of Francis Chan's books that I love. And it says, one of the quotes from one of the people that he asked says, I have to be rooted on his truth. Otherwise, I tend to make up my own truth. So this morning, let's be rooted in the truth of Jesus and not be so caught up and making up our own truth. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your son. And we stand here today united under the umbrella of Jesus. And God, we're thankful that we get the opportunity to reflect that love and that commitment that you give to us right back to you today. So God, I ask that you will use this moment as we take the bread and as we take the cup to remember you and to think about the sacrifice that you made so that we may have everlasting life, Father. So we thank you, we thank you, we thank you. And we ask that you will continue to fill our hearts and minds this morning as we worship and as we learn. Amen. Jesus, name above all.
So this morning, we are emphasizing our children's program, The Factory, and we have a little bit of a, a slightly different next step than we usually do at this time. So we're going to go ahead and have all of the kids come down and give their offering, but when they do that, we want all the kids to sit on either side on the steps. All right, so kids, all come down, give your offering, and then come get on the steps right here. Once they all get up here, I'm going to pray over them and our offering, and then they're going to sing a song for us, and, and while they're doing that, we're going to give our offering as well. All right, guys. What an awesome, awesome gift this is. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for our children and, and the work that, that we're doing in the factory, God. What an awesome thing that is for all of us. And, and to see it represented here on stage this morning is such a gift. And we're thankful for all of our kids and their heart. So we ask that you will let us have an amazing moment today and let their hearts sing out. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, you guys help him sing out there, okay? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones who in belong, ye are weak, but he is strong. 
Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Good job, guys. Good job. Isn't that awesome? If I could go ahead and ask you guys to stand up for me on the song before uh, Dave's message.
Mickey may be seated. Well, good morning and welcome. Um, if you are new to Jinx Church, you couldn't have picked a better time to get here. Um, we are we are excited about everything God's been doing, and, and in this series, we've been in this home series, we've really just tried to talk about families. Uh, we talked about marriage one week, and whether you have a terrible marriage and needs improvement, or you've got a great marriage, and you just want it to be better. We, we talked about some of that. And then last week, we talked about investing in the next generation. All right? We talked about our youth program, our middle school, high school, our Oasis youth group, and uh, why we do some of the things we do there. And, and today, I'm going to take you all the way back down to our kiddos, right? We call our children's ministry here, if you're new, we call it the factory. Um, I don't know why, it just seemed like a cool theme to, to start painting the hallways. And if you haven't seen the transformation of our children's wing, you need to go check that out. We can give you a tour and tell you kind of about the specific things back there. But we're excited about it. We're excited about what's going on, and, and we love seeing the kids. Um, every week, that's, that's the easiest illustration we can ever come up with as a church, just to show the life that is here and just how God is blessing us and encouraging us to continue to give back, uh, continue to give life into that generation. And that's important because for me, um, I'm here on this stage today. I'm able to do what I do in life because I had people in my childhood uh, who did that for me. And, and I want to tell you about a couple of them real quick off the top. There was a guy uh, in our church. I grew up in Chickasha, Oklahoma. And, and there's a guy in our church by the name of Mike Mosley. And uh, God love him. He volunteered to teach fourth and fifth grade boys. Enough said right there, right? I mean, he is a godly saint of a man. Because that's got to be the smelliest classroom there ever was. And holding their attention of like 15 to 20 fourth and fifth grade boys is got to be the toughest job ever. And yet, he signed up for that. Like, he volunteered. He loved it. And, and he did... Uh, I can still remember just he was always so excited and so glad to see us and, and just really was a positive force in, in a lot of young men's lives in a very, uh, in a very important age in, in which we needed as many good influences and, and healthy male role models as we could possibly get. Uh, and so i always, always appreciative of him and the time he gave. Then there's another lady, uh, a lady by the name of Joe Perryman. Uh, her husband's like a congressman now or something in Oklahoma, by the way. Uh, Joe was a high school theater teacher, uh, and she taught, a, she taught there in Chickasha, and they went to our church, and she was in charge of VBS. Now, if you don't know, VBS, Vacation Bible School, right? We would do the week-long thing in the morning where you get there, and you, you hear the Bible story, and you go through games and everything. And I got to be honest, I was always the skeptical kid when it came to the Bible story, because let's be honest, when you've got high school kids as actors and, and volunteers, and you've got moms playing every male role and, and all that, it's just a little hard to believe sometimes, right? And I was always the kid that kind of sat back and like, yeah, they, all this is fake, none of this is good, until about the summer of 1985. Now, how many of you weren't even born in 1985? All right, that's, that says a lot about who we are. We're glad you're here. Uh, we're glad you're here. You, you look at the world differently, and I love that. Um, in 1985, I was about six years old, and I'm sitting, I can, I can vividly see this in my mind. I'm sitting in this little courtyard area we had, and they're doing the story of David and Goliath. Now, I've heard the story of David and Goliath, even at six years old, probably a thousand times. Like, I knew the story. And I had seen it acted out in class and flannel graphs and all that. And everybody that raised their hand has no idea what a flannel graph is. That's okay. You don't need to know that. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> we got one that does, one that does. Uh, but I had seen it. And that summer, my whole world changed as I watched the story of David and Goliath. Because as David came out and he had a real slingshot, he began to spin it around and he let it fly. And then all of a sudden, this big giant of a man just went crashing down. And in VBS, that's typically where the story stops, but not in 1985. In 1985, David ran over and he pulled up what had to be the biggest sword I'd ever seen in my life. And due to some good blockage and things, cut off Goliath's head. I thought, this story just got way better than I ever remember it. But wait, there's more. Then he picks up a head 
Now, it was like a mannequin head preference, but at six, I thought it was the greatest thing ever, right? And he's holy, and I'm like, is that even in the Bible? Are we just making this stuff up now? Because like, I had not heard that version of David and Goliath. And from that moment on, I was hooked. I can pinpoint everything I've ever done in ministry when it relates to kids and youth and trying to make the Bible come alive to that morning in the summer of 1985. Because there was a lady who went out of her way to make the Bible come to life. And in so doing, got me excited about stories that otherwise were just old, tired, boring stories I had heard my whole life. And so because of her, because of people like Mike Mosley, because of all the other people that breathe life into me, I'm able to stand up here and do what I do. And so I, I want to go there today. I want to talk about that because something happened in my world. VBS was great. Sunday school was pretty good. But then I came into big church, right? Go in the auditorium. And there was nothing for me there. Right? Because when you're a kid, all you get to do is you color on the attendance cards or the offering envelope. Right? Or now, kids play with iPads or phones or, right? Or you read the songbook. When we were in trouble, we weren't allowed to draw, so all we could do is read the songbook. And we just, I don't know what we did, but we, you know, just, you just do those things. And there was a disconnect for me. And I, and I don't know what happened. I don't know why it happened. But, but for me, the, I love VBS. I love Bible school. But then I got into this, this room with all the adults, and suddenly there's a guy standing up in front who's either just talking <clears throat> in a monotone voice just like this and looking down at his notes the whole time, and he's just kind of boring, and they're not really sure what he's saying at all. Or he was screaming at you and just pounding the pulpit as hard as he could. And you just felt bad about yourself. You didn't know why. You just knew you were supposed to feel bad. So for me, big church was boring. It was hard. It's hard to endure. It was really just a matter of how quickly can we make it through this and survive and get, get to lunch. Now, I'm going to tell on my family a little bit. We were extra strict, right? We, we weren't allowed to talk or else my parents were the ones that would get up and like, thump you in the back of the head no matter where you were sitting, and we weren't allowed to leave. It didn't matter how bad you had to go to the bathroom, you were not allowed to get up. So that was church for me. Church was sit still, don't move, don't blink, don't breathe, and don't fall asleep. And that was hard. And I figured out real quick that that wasn't working for me, and that I don't really know where I fit into that, and I'm not sure exactly how I, can, how I was ever really going to get anything out of it. And let's be honest, moms and dads, especially moms, do you get anything out of church when you've got like a three, four-year-old sitting next to you? Shh, stop it. Or a 14, 15-year-old sitting next to you? Shh, quit it. Stop it. Leave your sister alone. Leave your brother alone, right? There's so much distraction, so much going on. And so I always said, if I ever get to a position, which I wasn't going to because I didn't want to work for a church at all. That was the last thing I wanted to do. But if I ever got to a position where I, had, I could have influence, it wasn't going to be that way. Because I wanted this to be an environment where the Bible came to life. I wanted this to be an environment. I wanted to have a church where I could come and I could just, I, I knew where my place was. And because you fast forward to about the age of 20, and I stepped into a world and a world of situations and, and things that life threw at me, and I didn't know how to handle it. Now, I made some terrible choices in that stage of my life, and I don't blame church at all for that. Don't, don't hear that. I don't blame church, right? But I often do wonder, if they had taken the call of Christ a little more seriously and invested just a little bit more in me as a kid, maybe when I got to that stage of life and I didn't know where to look and I didn't know what to do, maybe I would have responded just a little differently. So for me, that becomes the core of what we're going to talk about today. It's the core of what Jesus talks about when he talks about children. And it's the very essence of, of why we do children's ministry the way we do children's ministry. Because I believe all those kids you saw on the stage right here, they will change the world. I don't know when, and I don't know how, 
But I believe if we breathe life into them from God's word and from God's spirit, they will change the world and we get to be witness to it. And so what Jesus said about it, he, he comes at it from, from a way that's so countercultural, so counterintuitive. In Matthew chapter 18, he says this. We referenced it a little bit last week. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And they're kind of positioning. They're jockeying for position. Okay, maybe he's going to say me. He'll probably say John because he likes him the most. Maybe it's Peter. Maybe it's, right? And they're kind of trying to figure out where they rank in everything. But he called a little child to him, which was just unheard of. But he called a little child to him, and he placed that child among them. And he said, truly I tell you, unless you change and you become like little children, unless you become like the very thing that you ignore, unless you become like this thing that has no value to you, that you don't pay attention to, unless you become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of a child, whoever takes, takes this position of, of no importance. See, that's hard for us, isn't it? Because right? when we look at kids, we don't think lowly position. I mean, we go out of our way to make kids important, right? You go out to eat lunch today. They're going to ask you if you want a children's ministry uh, menu. Children's ministry. You can tell them, yeah, I've got one. They're going to ask you if you want a children's menu, right, if you've got kids. And with that children's menu comes crayons, comes wiki sticks, comes something to entertain your child. Why? Because we value kids. We think they're important. We, we make them feel important. We make them feel like they have their own. But not in Jesus' day. In Jesus' day, kids were, kids were forgotten. Kids were necessity at best. Little value, less importance. So when Jesus says, hey, here's a child. Become like this child. Take the lowly position of this child. The crowd has no clue. They can't wrap their mind around this idea of becoming like a child. He says, therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of a child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, and whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. He completely flips their world upside down. Again, it makes sense to us, right? Because we do everything we can for kids. We treat kids completely differently than they did in Jesus' culture. In our culture, we try and protect kids. We try and make them as safe as humanly possible, don't we? I remember as our girls were, were getting to the age of riding a bike, um, I just bought a bike. That's all I needed to teach them to ride a bike. And I was quickly instructed that, no, 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 they need a helmet, and they need elbow pads, and they need knee pads, and they need bubble wrap, and they need, right? And I thought, that's ridiculous. I didn't need all that stuff when I was a kid, and look how I turned out. She said, exactly, that's my point. <laughs> so we bought the helmet, and we bought the glove, right? We try and keep kids just as safe as possible. Car seats. Car seats today are designed by NASCAR engineers. Did you know that? Not NASA, NASCAR. Your car seat is designed by people who are used to going at 200 miles an hour. I'm not sure we had car seats, right? It was dad's arm that just held us in place when we needed to. I remember one time, uh, I know we didn't have car seats, because there was a time, I think it was my eighth birthday, and we were going to Chuck E. Cheese uh, for my birthday, and I jumped out of the car before the car was in the parking spot and, like, hit the ground and rolled, and got yelled at and in trouble right before my birthday party at, with some mouse, right? We didn't have car seats. Nets on trampolines, right? It takes all the fun out of trampolines. I don't even understand why we have them anymore. My girls have a net around theirs. We didn't have one around ours. Right? The best part was the double bounce. Because you could double bounce your friend and shoot them right off the edge of the trampoline. <laughs> right? And that was the best. But we don't do that today. Today it's all about safety. Today it's all about keeping them safe and whole. But listen, they don't live in a safe world, do they? We, we live in a world that is attacking our children. I gave you some stats last week that will just scare you to death about what kids are encountering. You know, we think about things like human trafficking. The fact that our kids have access to Google and social media 
and online chat and games and things like that. Our kids are exposed to so much. But the point of me bringing all this up is not to scare you or to make you feel bad or any of that. The idea is we have to understand if that's the world our kids are in, we've got to be about the, about the business of making a difference in their life. We have to look at our children, and we want to not just make a dent in some of the stats. We want to make a difference in our world through them. And so we've got to take Jesus serious when he calls and he says, listen, you've got to put value in your kids. They're important. The way they see Jesus, the way they see God, the way they see the world, is we need to gravitate towards that. We need to become more like them in that. Listen, in his day... You, didn't, you had too many kids, you didn't want to split your inheritance, by law, you could kill one of your kids. Kids born with defect, disability, drown them in the river, leave them on the road, abandon them. That was the mindset that Jesus was speaking to when he said, hey, no more. Kids are of value. I love them. Bring them to me. Let me show you how they're loved. Let me show you how much they matter. And when we take Jesus at his word, we make a difference. The church always has. That's how orphanages got started. The fact that we saw, Christians saw kids who were being abandoned and left, and they took Jesus, and they said, okay, that's who he told me to take care of. That's who he told me to love and protect, so that's what I'm going to do. The trouble with that is, we're really forgetful people. And more than just forgetful, we oftentimes hear what Jesus says, and we don't really understand what he says. Right? We hear it, we say, ah, oh, Jesus said that. That's good stuff. I have no idea what he meant, but it was good. Well, the disciples are no different. Because if you flip over to just the next chapter, or you thumb over in your device or whatever, the disciples who just heard Jesus say, bring the children to me. I love kids. Bring them here. Become like them. They miss it when he starts talking again. Verse 13 of chapter 19, he says, then people brought little children to Jesus. The people had heard, the people knew, the people, hey, hey, he likes kids. Let's bring him our kids. Why? Well, so that he could place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked them. The very disciples who just heard Jesus say, let the little kids come to me. Hey, we don't have time for that. We've got important things to be about. Jesus is talking, no kids allowed. Get them away from here. They missed it. They missed exactly what Jesus was trying to say. So he says it again. Verse 14, let the children come to me. And here's the line. And do not hinder them. Let the little children come and do not hinder them. For the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. And when he had placed his hands on them, he went on from there. I mentioned a little bit last week, but that's the line for me. When we talk about how we do children's ministry, talk about why we invest so much energy and effort and time and money in children's ministry, because we are going to be a church that does not hinder kids from seeing Jesus. And yet, for a long time, churches have. We, we don't mean to, but we just kind of get in the way. I, for me, it was Sunday night church. You remember Sunday night church? Right? Sunday morning, you had Bible school. That was good. But then you had to go to big church. That was, uh... Wednesday night, you had Bible class. That was good. But Sunday night, Sunday night, there was nothing for me. Right? You sit down, be quiet, listen. And I'm not knocking, I understand that important things happened and lives were changed. I'm not knocking the idea of Sunday night church or any church. What I'm, what I'm saying is, as a kid, there was nothing there for me. And it wasn't helping me to meet Jesus. It was really hindering it. Because as I looked around at the adults there on Sunday night, I saw a lot of people who were frustrated and tired and unhappy and there out of obligation, not out of love. And so as I grew up, you know what I figured out? The only people that go on Sunday night go because they have to, because they always have. And then I became a youth minister, and you know what I found out to be true? Only people going on Sunday night are people that were going because they had to and felt obligated. Right? And I'm not judging, I'm just saying that's my experience. 
Uh, that's, what I, that's my story. That's how, what I've seen. And so I grew up, and I love Sunday school. I love Wednesday night. I love VBS. But I got into, into the church, and I didn't really know how I fit. And I didn't know, as I became an adult, how my kids were going to fit. So what we've done is we've began to change that. We began to create an environment because we desperately want kids to meet Jesus. And we don't want to hinder them from that. We don't want to do anything that makes them think this is a set of rules and rituals and obligations. We want kids to see us as adults. We want kids to see other kids. We want kids to see youth. We want an environment in which people show up and they're able to meet Jesus wherever they're at and find joy in it. So here's the deal. I've got two goals for our children's ministry. I've been here seven months. We've had the same two goals that from day one. We will have the same two goals in 100 years when, when I leave this place, right? Two goals. Here's number one. We want our kids to love Jesus. That's the number one goal. No matter what else we do, no matter how we do, we don't want them to fall in love with a system. And listen, I love a good system. But we don't want them to fall in love with a system. We don't even want them to fall in love with a movement. We want our kids to fall in love with Jesus. Because it's a struggle because we can't make them, can we? I have two daughters. A few years ago, I had... Laney, for sure, Ella Grace played along, but, but I had Laney convinced that I got to pick her husband. <laughs> Not kidding you. Like, she would tell you right off the bat, my dad gets to pick who I marry. It was the best thing ever. Like, that's the system I wanted in place forever because she's never getting married uh, until she's 100. Then she can get married on her own, right? But I don't get to pick who she falls in love with. I don't get to pick who she decides to just be so consumed with that I become very unimportant and he swoops in. It's going to happen. I can't make her love Jesus. But what I can do is I can create an environment around her that, that, and just push all the money, all the energy, all the resources, all of everything I have and just build it up like kindling around her heart and then my prayer becomes God set it on fire. God, set her heart on fire for you. And then I just keep feeding the flame. And that's what our children's ministry, that's what we're going to create here. That's what David and Chris are doing an amazing job doing. It's just getting kids to love coming and hearing about Jesus. That's why we, that's why we send them out. So that's, that's a thing in churches. Like people get frustrated. Well, I want the kids to stay in the whole time and hear the sermon. No, they don't. You don't want your kids to hear the things that come out of my mouth. I promise you, right? I don't even want my kids to hear the things that come out of my mouth sometimes, right? We want them to go to their environment and learn about Jesus on their level because we want them to fall in love with Jesus because, listen, no matter who you are, there's one truth. You never get over your first love. Every one of you can remember the first person that you fell in love with. And I do that because maybe you did, maybe you didn't, I don't know you. But you had a boyfriend, you had a girlfriend, you had that one person. And you'll always remember them. And no matter where you go in life, no matter how happy you are, you'll always have that special sentimental place in your heart for that person. And if that person is Jesus for my girls, it won't matter what life they step into. It won't matter what this world throws at them. It won't matter how far they run. They will always have something deep down in their heart that longs to get back to their first love and longs to have that flame rekindled. And, and so that's what I want. I want our kids to learn to love Jesus. Because what if? What if we raised a generation of kids that actually believed? that Jesus saves people from their sins? What if our children grow up knowing that Jesus can do immeasurably more than anything we can imagine? What if we raise a generation of kids who know that Jesus is the hope of the world and their hearts believe that 
And their life is governed by that. They change the world. They change everything about the world they live in. That kids are learning about Jesus because we want kids to find their identity in Christ, not in Instagram, not in social media. That we want our young people to grow up knowing that they are sons and daughters of the king. The kids in the factory right now, they're learning all about Jesus at their level and in ways that engages them and excites them and that they can't wait to get back and learn more about. And those kids, those kids will change the world. And I want to be part of that. I want to be an investor in those lives. I want them to love Jesus. There's a second goal. I want them to love church. I, I want them to love church mainly because I didn't as a kid. Now, I do now. I love church. I'm all about church. I've got T-shirts that say I love church, right? I love church. I think it's the hope of the world. I think this is the thing that God put in play that says no matter how crazy our world gets, this is the place that you can go and find people who will introduce you to God. So I love church, and I want our kids to grow up loving church. Church, I want, I want it to be a place where they can come, not because it's full of perfect people, because it's not. We all mess up. We all drop the ball. We all have mistakes and sin, and, right? And, and church hasn't always been that. For, for some of you, church hasn't been that for you, right? I remember uh, some friends of ours, uh, they weren't friends at the time. They were new to church, and, and they were coming, uh, and we started having this conversation, and they said, hey, I, not here. This was in Texas. They said, I used to go to church here as a kid. Really? What, what happened? What, where you been? Did you move off? Did you co- no, we just hadn't been coming. She said, because my sister, who two, who's two years older than me, when she was 16, got pregnant. And because she got pregnant and how all screwiness of that happens and all the things that churches do, church ran them off. Wouldn't let them be there anymore. Because they wouldn't say the right things or do the right things according to the church. I've got other friends that they get divorced and they're no longer, one of them has to choose, one of them has to leave, one of them has to. Church hasn't always been good. Church hasn't always gotten it right. I get that. But if we can be a church that raises a generation that loves Jesus, then we can be a church that's worth loving. And that's what I want my kids to experience. That's what I want your kids to to experience a church worth loving love a church not full of perfect people people that mess up people that make mistakes but people who in spite of their stakes of their mistakes are still loved by god and still have a place in the kingdom that nothing is a death sentence nothing is the final say until jesus comes back that if we're still living and breathing he still has grace and love and mercy, and forgiveness. That's the church I want my kids to love. That's who I want them to become. So what you need to know about our children's ministry, about the factory, it's working. The things we're doing, the things our kids are experiencing are changing lives. They are working. They are exciting kids. They are bringing them in. Uh, Here's how I know it's working. Last night, before we went to bed, you know, we talked about the whole time change things, and Lainey looks at me and goes, Dad, will you set the alarm 15 minutes earlier than usual? I said, yeah, why? She said, because I don't want Mom to make us late for church today. <laughs> now, Lainey's now grounded, um, just for the record, <laughs> but, but she so wanted, she didn't want to miss out. Right? They love coming here. Heath and I and Corley, we, we've talked about this. Uh, the four of us, Amanda and I, we, we've all talked about this. That our kids love coming to church. Like, it's exciting to see all these kiddos up here, isn't it? And, and so it's, I want you to know it's working. So if you give to this church, if you volunteer in this church, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, because what we're doing is working. Kids are loving Jesus, and they're loving church. But there's more work to be done. There's more things to do. Our group is growing. We need more people investing. And listen, I get it. You're tired. You know what my least favorite activity of every day is? Homework. Hate doing homework with the girls. 
Because some days it takes 7,000 hours and lots of tears, and I hate it. But here's what you need to hear. You're not doing it alone. Because our kids, while we get frustrated, while we get tired, while we have trouble investing in them sometimes, whether it's schoolwork or church work, or we've got other people who are. So here's what I want to do. I've got a little video. This is a video of our kids from the factory. Uh, some are photos. Some are them showing you what they're learning. Now, what you're going to see are facts and figures. That's all it is. Okay? It's just them reciting things they've memorized. But look at some of the things they've memorized. Kids that aren't excited about what they're doing don't invest this amount of time in what they're doing. Check this out. It's a mama singing songs about the Lord It's a daddy spending family time The world says he cannot afford These simple moments change the world The books of the Bible 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 are The books of the Bible Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1 Samuel, 2 Samuel, 1 Kings, 2 Kings, 1 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentation, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. The major characters of Genesis. The major characters of Genesis. Major characters of Genesis. The 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 major characters of Genesis. Adam and Eve. Cain and Abel. Noah. Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob and Esau, Israel, Leah and Rachel, the 12 sons of Israel, Gad, Iskar, Reuben, Levi, Simeon, Joseph, Judah, Zebulun, Benjamin, Asher, Naphtali, Dan, Ephraim, and Manasseh. The 12 sons of Israel, the 12 sons of Israel, the 12 sons of Israel, Gad, Iskar, Reuben, Levi, Simeon, Joseph, Judah, Zebulun, Benjamin, Asher, Nikolai, the 15 judges. The 15 judges. The 15 judges. Othniel, Ehud, Shamgar, Deborah, Gideon, Abimelech, Tola, Jer, Jephthah, Ibzan, Elon, Abdon, Samson, Eli, Samuel. Keep loving, keep serving, keep listening, keep learning, keep praying, keep hoping, keep seeking, keep searching. from rivers <coughs> Turn it off, turn it off. <laughs> These simple moments change the world It's bad when you're the preacher's kid and he catches you. Yeah, give those kids a hand. Yeah. <laughs> Here's the deal. One, I would challenge anybody in here that can do all of that Go challenge the kids and see who's better. But again, those are just facts. That's not what it's about, but it shows how much they love what they're doing. Because I'm going to make a confession. I've not worked with my two daughters at all on it. I'm not bragging. I'm confessing. We're busy. We've got a lot going on. My kids are in an environment full of Mike Mosley's full of Joe Perrymans, full of you who are investing and breathing life into kids, who are teaching them to love Jesus, who are teaching them to love church. So here's what you need to hear today. We need more. We need more of you. We, we need you serving and stepping out in ways that you don't think you can do, in ways that you're convinced your time has passed or it will never come. But I'm telling you, there's a place for you. 
Because your job, your role in the kingdom, your role in our church is huge. Because the older my kids get, the less my voice will be important to them. And I need other godly voices teaching them, sharing with them. Because you've got kids. You know it. Sometimes all they need to do is hear it from somebody who's not their parent. You've said it for 1,500 times. But their friend's dad says it, and they believe every bit of it. We need that. We need to partner together. So here's what we're going to do as we close today. I'm going to pray over you, and, and, and there's a couple of, couple of ways we're going to address this. One, I'm just going to pray blessings over our kids, our families, and ask God to maybe, maybe motivate some hearts to serve and to love and to be one of those godly voices in the lives of our kids. But there's another group. There's a group that you may have not had an experience like this. You may have not grown up in an environment. Today may have been the first day that you knew that God loves you. We're going to pray for you too. And if we can help you take a next step in discovering that, in discovering maybe you were, maybe you were hurt by a church and, and this is your first step back today, and we can help you learn to love this place. We want to do that. So I'm going to pray over you. We'll close. But if you need to follow up with anything, please seek myself out, any of our shepherds, and we'll definitely do that. But let's bow as we close this morning. Heavenly Father, thank you for kids. We were all one once. Uh, thanks for all those folks that breathed life into us, that looked over us, that, that helped us and encouraged us. God, I thank you, thank you for folks like Mike Mosley who put up with a bunch of smelly uh, intermediate school boys and loved them even when they were completely unlovable. God, thank you for the Joe Perrymans who made your word come to life and spark something in me that, that is yet to go out. And God, make me a good steward of that flame. Help me to pass it on to the next generation. God, thank you for the folks in this room who have invested so many hours and so much love into classes and ministries and activities and lessons. And God, thank you for the moms and dads who it was all they could do to just get here today. And that's huge. Thank you for their trust. The trust that they put in us that, that we're, we're helping introduce their kids to you. So God, bless that time. Bless everything that's going on in the factory. Uh, bless all of our teachers and our volunteers. God, bless our families and our kids. God, for those that, that today just need to be reminded of your love, I, I pray that they may not even like kids, and they may have heard nothing I said today. Let them just hear your voice as you let them know they're loved. As you let them know you've got a place for them in your kingdom. God, for anybody here or listening or watching online, God, that, that has experienced hurt from a church, God, on behalf of churches, I'm, I'm sorry. Sorry that we haven't reflected you the way we should have. And I pray that from this moment forward, that anybody you send in our direction, God, we will partner with, we will journey with, and we will not hinder them from seeing you. So God, today we just celebrate, we lift up, we're excited about all that you're doing in our life, God. And we just pray that we do it all for your glory, for the world's good, and for our joy. And we pray it in your son's name. Amen. Hey, if you're here today and you're a first-time guest, again, welcome. Stop by the information desk. We've got some stuff for you. And uh, I was also told to remind the guys, softball, if you're wanting to play, gather up over here. Nate Green will meet you there, and he'll tell you all about it. Other than that, have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday. Take care.